Hello everybody, welcome Soundies to our Sound 4 video session to the July 17th, 2022 edition. It's great to have you here. Summer is most definitely here. Um, that's why we're wearing a t-shirt today because it is hot. Um, uh, great Again, great to have you all here. I hope you had a great week and let's jump into our agenda and see what we've got going for today. So first up, uh, let's run through our signal chain. So we have something a little different this week. And I want to run through that. I have my Earthworks Ethos here. That is running into the Allen & Heath SQ5 mixer, which is sitting just behind me over here, and which, incidentally, I am able to control remotely. Let me just reconnect here uh, via the SQ app here that allows me to change things. You'll notice also here on the second channel where it says KSM8, that's a mic for Emma. Good morning, Emma. Hey, how are we doing? Good to have you here as well. <laughs> um, so that then feeds into the uh, Canon C200. So we're running line out of the SQ5 into the Canon C200. That feeds into the ATEM Mini Extreme ISO via HDMI, where it's already combined the audio from the mixer and the cam the video from the camera. That goes out of the ATEM Mini Extreme ISO into a decimator 12G cross converter. Um, so it goes from HDMI to SDI, and then the SDI goes out into the other room where it feeds into the Epifan Pearl Nano encoder, which is encoding this and sending it to YouTube. So that's our full signal chain for today. All right, um, next thing I wanna cover is a new book. Uh, this was sent to me by the author whose name is Edgar. And Edgar, I apologize, I don't know how to pronounce your last name. If I had to guess, I think it's Yas Yakolena or Yaselena, not sure. <laughs> but the name of the book is Production Sound Mixer Notes and Thoughts. And for those that are interested specifically in production sound, so sound for film production, um, this is a fascinating book. He sent this to me a couple weeks ago. Um, I was a little under the weather earlier this week, so I took an opportunity to read. That's unfortunately <laughs> about, uh, one of the few times I actually get to read like printed actual books. Um, I listen to audiobooks all the time, but um, printed books. And what's neat about this book is that he interviews one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different production sound mixers across the world. And he kind of gets their insights. He asks them the same series of questions in each case and um, has some nice illustrations as well. So, for example, one that he interviewed is Todd Maitland from the United States and uh, shows Todd with his mixing cart here, who incidentally on this mixing cart, right here is also using an Allen Heath SQ5. Um, but ask them the same series of questions and gets their perspective on a number of things. Let me just read a couple things off the back here. Uh, he gets kind of a one-line quote from each of the mixers that he interviewed. And, oh wait. Sync issues. We have sync issues. Yes. Um, people are saying we're out of sync, okay. Uh, what we're gonna do, let's go take a look. Right. Um, let's go back to the Agenda view. Super source. Or... Mm, super source, yep. Okay. Let's see if we can solve this right here. Um, if I go to the mix here, there's no delay applied right now. And I don't know why I would need to apply a delay since I'm going directly into camera. Uh, but we can, can go ahead and apply that. Let's go ahead and see. I'm going to do a clap here. Is it universal? Like, is it multiple people saying sync issues? Okay, two people. If you're watching on iOS devices, if you can reload the stream, sometimes that makes a difference. I've noticed iOS devices, the sometimes the stream gets out of sync. Here I've applied a 133 millisecond delay, um, which is approximately f at 30 frames per second. That should be what, four frames, something like that, so. No, we have three saying it's fine to two saying. Okay, all right, we're gonna go with it. I apologize, we will look into that. I don't see why it should be doing that, but um, in any case, we're gonna go back to talking about the production sound mixer book. All right, um, so a couple of quotes here from Gunt Guntis Seeks for there are three dimensions in this job, the technology, the logistics, and the psychology involved in dealing with a wide variety of people and crafts. At any given time, at least one of these three things gives me joy. Uh, Todd Maitland is quoted as saying, one of the things my father taught me was half of being a good sound mixer is what we know 
technically how to get sound and all that. The other half is how we play the game. What he meant by how we play the game is how we interact with all the other players we collaborate with on a film set. Chris Monroe quoted as saying, our part, sorry, our job is to capture the performance and not to influence it. Stefano Campus says, it is essential to not chase your ideal perfect sound, but rather to listen to the person who has conceived the film. Interesting insights here. Uh, Patrick Becker says, stress has perhaps become one of uh, my greatest enemies over the years. It is unnecessary and always arises when you want more. Haven't read that one yet. That's an interesting, interesting one. Nakul Kamte, uh, I believe based in India, said, on the scene where on the scene where if someone's crying or breaking down or whatever, no matter what, I mean, even if a bomb falls, I will never shout cut on that scene. I will just let it roll and let the director take that because I know the actors, how difficult it is for the actors to work themselves into that. Again, talking about capturing performance. Pascal Armand, when I started out, a Nagra, a microphone on a pole, and a few other microphones were enough, but the results were not always excellent. Nowadays, shooting is only done by wiring all the actors. So again, really interesting book. Um, in fact, if we cut over to the Mac here really quickly, um, I put a link down below, but you can actually get this over at Amazon. And it looks like it's available right now, both print copy and you can also get it for Kindle if you prefer. Okay, good deal. Let's come on back to our agenda here. All right, next up, um, actually I'm gonna run through the agenda and then we'll come back. Emma's gonna walk us through one way to take a dialogue recording that has background music in it and reduce that background noise. So this is just one way to do it. Um, she's got an audio sample she put together and walk us through this. This was actually a question. I've, I got this question a, month, a bunch of times. Um, and the reason this is important, if you're going to produce a video and you're recording it in a space where there's music playing, for example, in this case, coffee, uh, Ono Coffee sent this in, uh, sent in a, this question, had an extreme example of this where he's doing an interview in a coffee shop and there is massive music playing in the background. And the problem is, is if he had published that interview, it would receive a copyright strike because he doesn't have copyrights. Uh, to, he doesn't have the copyright permission to use that music in his videos. And so that's one example of where you might need to pull this down and see if you can correct it. Now, I will say, Ono Coffee, your, your uh, example was extreme. I'm not sure <laughs> uh, how you, you could totally remove it. But um, in any case, we'll run through one way to do that. And then we'll come back and do our question and answer. So let's go ahead and give me just a second here. I'm, I'm going to get the fader set correctly for this and then switch on over to Isotope. If you want to switch over to that, we will change seats and Emma will run you through how to reduce background music. Okay. All right. Hi, Soundies. I haven't been on a live stream for about a year. <laughs> um, so yeah, as we were saying, this is a question from Ono Coffee. And yes, um, the whole YouTube copyright strike thing, I'm sure many of you are aware of the frustrations that we often have with that. So um, I was tasked with finding a potential solution to that, that issue and seeing... <clears throat> excuse me, seeing if we could get music, if there was a way to, quote, scrub music out of the background of a clip, if you really, really have to use it in your project. So we are here in Isotope RX. We want to be in spectral view because essentially what I'm going to show you how to do here is how to recognize what music looks like spectrally. So you know what to remove from this recording and what to leave in because, of course, when we're cleaning dialogue, we don't want to really crush the noise profile of the room. That'll be, it, it just won't sound right, of course. So let's listen to this and you can get an idea of what we are starting with. So now, because this is going to be also a dialogue test while that's playing, I'm going to keep talking. I have my back to the music and this is a super directional mic. So the music and my voice should be coming in 
straight on access to this mic. There's some of just the music. This is more of the music and my voice. This is an untreated room, no sound treatment at all. Okay, so that's what we're starting with. And the idea here is, of course, not to get this dialogue perfectly clean. There are going to be artifacts because there's no way really to separate the shape of the dialogue waveform and the shape of the music and our room noise, which is right here. But we can get it to a place where we probably won't have copyright issues. So we're going to come over here to spectral denoise. This is, of course, an excellent isotope plugin. And we're going to choose the brush tool down here. So, actually, before I do that, let me play through. I guess I have to close this. Is that the right tool? Yeah. Okay. Let me play through me talking and the music and see if you can guess which part of the shape of this waveform is the music. So the music and my voice should be coming in straight on axis to this mic. So if you were listening along super closely there, you can probably see that these little orange ticks at the bottom of our waveform are not waveform, sorry, spectral view are lined up with the bass drum in the song. So we have a rough idea of our music being probably these little orange marks here. And it, yes, it is very hard to see amongst the dialogue. That's why we're going to zoom in a lot. So now we can open up spectral denoise again. And this is going to be, of course, as with all audio operations, a very, very case specific thing that you do in here with all your adjustments that you can make. <coughs> excuse me, and how you adjust this to work for whatever it is that you are spectrally removing. So in the case of Ono Coffee's sample, which I did work with, we can't use it here because copyright again, um, but you may have to go very extreme on your threshold and reduction. You may have to not crank it at all. You, you will have to experiment with it. But there are some things that we can definitely adjust. So we want to go to more musical noise. That explains itself a little bit. Um, quality, I would leave at best because we want to leave as much of the recording as natural as possible because we're literally surgically removing noise and you want to minimize the amount of that that you do. So I like to start with my threshold just a just very small and reduction can stay probably let's say around 25 and this graph shows you in a visual way what that will do so we're going to come back to the brush tool again and as we determined these orange marks are what we want to get rid of so be very precise about this and highlight those and again leave as much of the room noise and dialogue as you can this is going to be easier when you have breaks in the dialogue okay and i'll leave some of this on the edges so that we can compare it afterwards and we can even try to output the noise only. Let's see what we've selected. Yeah, so we can hear that we have, in fact, selected music. So let's go ahead and render that. And we can see that it took out a good amount of the frequencies we wanted to get rid of. So now we can continue doing that. Might want to run some more on these little patches right here. And remember, this is not going to come out perfect. It's only going to get you to a spot where you won't get copyright flagged. But that's equally important, so. 
etc. And now we might also move up into these mid-range frequencies. Now one thing I did find working with Ono Coffee Sample is that you want to avoid doing too much vertical reduction. The algorithm of this plugin doesn't like doing that very much, so try to keep it really, really localized as in as much as possible. And also be careful not to remove too much of your dialogue. Okay. Let's render that. And you can see as we progressively render this multiple times, we get less and less of our problem areas. So this is a very tedious process. It is, if you're being super careful about your recordings and meticulous as we teach you, you will probably not need to do this very much. Again, it's like a, it's a way to get the most out of a recording that you just couldn't record in ideal situations. So let's zoom back out, come over here and try this on a piece of dialogue where I am talking and there is music. So we'll pull our brush tool back up. And while you do this in spaces where there's not much dialogue, you want to really take note of what frequencies the noise is occurring at. So it's going to be this very bottom part. And you can remember you have this great tool at your disposal also. So run this often as a preview and make sure that you're not getting too much dialogue in your selection. Straight on axis to this mic. Straight on axis to this mic. Okay. Run with preview also. Whoops. Could you record the music at the loudspeaker and use that to help subtract it from the vocal track? What does that mean, record the music at the loudspeaker? I don't know how to do that. That might be a good question for you to answer. Okay. <laughs> which you can go ahead and do while I do this. We'll turn it on. Excuse me for a minute. All right, Emma just unmuted me here. So that's a great question from Robert. Let me just put that up again here really quickly. Odd question, could you record the music at the loudspeaker and use that to help subtract it from the vocal track? There are, in fact, some... Um, Plugins that allow you to do that will actually take as an input to train the noise reduction algorithm to do that. Um, I know that, uh, what was the name of the company? And they were bought by somebody else and I don't know what's happened to them. Um, I'll, have to, I'll have to do some research to remember what that was, but there was another company that made a denoise that did something like that. So yeah, that's another valid option as well. Mike has another one here. As the music is comparatively low level, I'm wondering if music rebalance might also be useful in this situation. I've used it to good effect. And I think, yeah, definitely, Mike, that's another option worth exploring here. And then Mark asks, do you have to uncheck output noise only before rendering? That's one for Emma. I don't think you do. Are you sure? Well, let's try it. Let's... <laughs> Straight on axis. Okay, it's unchecked. Okay, now undo. Okay, and Check now it, it is and, checked. And now run it. Oh, I guess yeah, you do. You definitely do. Yep, good question, Mark. Yeah, thank you. Okay, point being with all of this that, uh, yes, dialogue isolate can also help you in this situation. 
Um, this is more for surgically removing very, very specific frequencies, like I showed you with the kick drum. It may it, dialogue isolate might help you. It might not. It's all it's all contextual. So this is one thing you could experiment with if you were having a problem like this. Hopefully that helped you. Thanks. All right, thank you, Emma. Um, so we're on a mission, actually. This is just the first. <laughs> I think what we, there are a lot of other tools that we want to explore here. I've got headphone hair. Um, so that's just going to be the case. I have headphone hair approximately 50% of my life overall, um, <laughs> which which I'm okay with. Um, yeah, there are definitely, I think everyone had, so, or several people had some really good ideas in terms of other tools that could be used. I think Music Rebalance is probably a good one to, to check next. That would be an interesting one. In fact, if you bring that back up on screen here, let me just show you what that looks like. If you can bring the Mac up. Uh, Michael, I have PTSD from when Alan from Soundspeeds ate a spoonful of peanut butter and outputted noise only. Yeah, me too. I don't, I can't do that. That's, that's, that's um, abusive to the audience. But the music rebalance here allows you to, it actually will detect the distinction between vocals, bass, percussion, and other music and allow you to kind of dial in the separation and actually um, cut the levels of the individual bits. So, and you can actually solo them to hear what it's detecting as each of those. So this actually, Mike, uh, to your point, could be a really, a really interesting one that could potentially um, make that a lot more automated. So good. Okay, great. Let's come back over to our agenda. And I think next up, we have some questions that were submitted ahead of time. Let's take a look at those and see what we've got here. First up from Andrew P. I might need some help on this one for anyone who's worked with a Tascam dr 10 recorder. Uh, Andrew says, I have a question about an issue I had with recording from a Sankin 3.5 millimeter lav running into a Tascam DR10 recorder. The recording was fine, except for two slight glitches where it stopped recording completely for a fraction of a second. These dropouts were very close together, about three seconds apart. I was using the setup as a plant mic, so there was nothing physically going on with the recorder or mic. The full recording was 90 minutes long, and there were no other issues aside from this one about 30 minutes in. Have you ever, ever experienced anything like this before? Not with that particular combination is my answer. Um, here's what's interesting. So I, th I think you brought some really interesting information, Andrew, in terms of noting, that, okay, there's a plant mic, so nobody was jostling things around. Normally, the very first thing I would check is you know, is there some sort of connection issue? That's almost always where when you run into those kind of things, it's almost always the connector or the cabling on the microphone that's having an issue. It could be a cabling on a microphone, but in light of the fact that it was being used as a plant mic and nobody touched it during that period of time, um, that seems a little bit less likely, but um, that's the first thing that came to my mind. If anyone else has other insights on that combination, we would love to hear what um, advice you might have for Andrew. The only other thing I can think is that some, there was just some glitch of some sort in the, the Tascam. Um, I never experienced that when I used that particular recorder, but I didn't do really long recordings like that either. It sounds like, what was it, 90 minutes, and that was 30 minutes in. So not, not something I typically did, although that is not unusual, I would think, with uh, body pack recorders. A lot of times that's what you would do. You'd start the recording and you'd actually let it run for a good period of time. So um, good question. Again, love to hear any insights that anyone has uh, for our friend Andrew there. Okay, we had one more question, this one from Lewin. And Lewin asks, I'm looking to get some wind protection for my shotgun mic, was considering a super softy versus a blimp. Is there a reason to have one over the other? I have recently started getting jobs as a sound mixer, but I mainly do video. So I'm trying to build up my sound kit slowly so that I can service those who come in for audio. Trying to figure out what is the best route to take re uh, regarding making a purchase. Let's switch on over, E, if you would, to the Mac here. All right. So this is what he's talking about when he's referring to a super softy. So Rycote makes these. They're the kind that you slide directly onto your microphone. And 
here is my experience and the distinction, Lewin, between these is that those that you slide onto the microphone, traditionally, I haven't used the, the, the Super Softy with a 3D text material on it, but traditionally, because they don't put as much space between the diffusion material and the microphone capsule itself, they generally can't handle higher winds. They can handle slight breezes, but once you get into higher winds, that's where the, the kind of the attached directly to the microphone types traditionally haven't worked that well. However, two things, Bubble Bee Industries and Rycote now both are making, uh, Rycote in this case making this with a 3D text material, and Bubble Bee is making uh, the spacer bubble and their whole line of, of, of similar types of things. Um, they may work better. I haven't tried them, so I don't know. But generally, the idea with a blimp is that you put more space between the diffusion material and the microphone, and so that gives the whatever wind does hit the diffusion material, it gives it more space to diffuse before it hits the microphone capsule. So in short, usually the blimps are more effective at preventing, uh, you know, picking up that wind noise. So that's the main difference there. I think something like the Rycote Super Softy would be a fine place to start. And then if you get a client that wants to work in high winds, um, then that's a different situation altogether. So I, I will say though, um, I think a lot of times too, that the kind that you have to put directly on the mic have to you, they have to get more aggressive about diffusing that, that air before it hits the microphone capsule. Um, I would think that that would affect the overall sound to some extent, and that is to say it would cut off more of the high frequencies versus a really well-designed blimp cover, blimp style cover. So that's one thing to keep in mind as well. So if you're, you know, if you're really, really particular and your clients are really, really particular, probably a blimp would be the best choice. It's bigger, it's bulkier, takes a little more time to set it up, um, but you get a more transparent sound, at least in theory, depending on the particular one you use, um, and it is bigger and bulkier. So those are kind of the trade-offs. Uh, most things, like most things, there, there are trade-offs. And so overall, those are the kind of my insights onto that. I'd be curious, anyone who used the, the Rycote Super Softy with the 3D text material, I'm curious what your experience has been with that. If you could drop that in the chat, we'd love to hear about that as well. All right, let's hop on over to the chat and see what's going on there and see what questions we might look to answer. I'm going to take a sip of water while we're waiting for those to come in. Emma's going to take a look at those. Okay, what are you seeing out there in the chat, E? Okay, first from Mike, Tascam DR10 issue. My bet would be a dodgy recording card. Ah, test with a different card. Great point, Mike. I think that is worth a check. I don't remember if the Tascam DR10 recorders had a card test option. I don't think they did. That's something I've seen in a lot of the Zoom recorders, which is a nice feature, incidentally. Um, but yeah, I would check. That's that's worth, worth checking the card for sure. Weird that it went 30 minutes, nothing, and then 30 minutes, got the little issue, and then another 60 minutes without the issue. But you never know. Okay. I'm a scrolling through intensely. Oh, here's one from Mark. Would love to see a similar session reducing reverb and echo. I have lots of run and gun video and it drives me nuts in locations I have no control of. Yeah, absolutely. Um, be prepared to be a little bit underwhelmed, <laughs> Mark. That they, they're, they're impressive, but I think what happens is a lot of people, I will say this, a lot of video editors will apply the D-Reverb plugins and they'll just crank them down. And so it ends up sounding like the person is talking into a pillow. Um, they're like, look, the reverb's gone. And indeed it's gone. Um, <laughs> but then it starts to sound a little weird. Um, there is another tool. Um, let me just show you here in RX. We can pop back over here. So of course there is the, the D-Reverb. Um, what? What did I do? Uh, go ahead and hit auto. There we go. Oh, we've lost our program feed. Um, there we go. Okay. Uh, so lesson learned. <laughs> Emma accidentally hit the fade to black button. Is like, what's going on? Um, so there is a fade to black button on the control panel here for the ATEM switcher. And she accidentally bumped that. Um, and it was underneath the laptop, so she couldn't see it very well, I'm guessing, right? I don't know what I did. 
anyway, um, so a couple of tools here in Isotope RX. There's the D reverb, and there's also the Dialog D reverb. Um, so kind of two separate approaches to the same thing. This one in the D reverb, you get a lot more kind of control of the low, mids, highs, and highs. Um, several different things here in the Dialog re D reverb. It's a, it's a little bit more straightforward. You basically just set the, the sensitivity, the ambience preservation and how much reduction you want to do. So, and then you get to choose the algorithm. Um, yeah, we can definitely go through those, Mark. That's a good one. I think what a lot of people find, though, again, is that they, they end up applying this really heavily, and then they're really disappointed in the results, so it sounds very muffled once they're done. I have What I haven't tried is, after doing that, maybe applying some spectral recovery here in Isotope. Um, that could potentially work maybe i don't know it'd be interesting to see so definitely noted and let's come back to another session where we have a good sample ready for you and we can we can walk through that if we have time later today uh, or later this session we might actually be able to do something like that let's see what other questions are out in the chat and i'll i'll actually queue up a file i know we have with plenty of reverb um, this is one that we used for our isotope course in fact and it is. We'll go ahead and pull that up. Okay, let's go ahead and see what else is in the chat, and then we'll come back to this. Ah, Mark, thank you. Yes, Accusonus was the company bought by Meta and discontinued all their Era plugin products. Um, <laughs> I am, yeah, that's that to me is like, why, why did you do that? But I, I assume what that means is, I, I have to think that is that like Meta as in Facebook? Um, that could just get lost forever then. Um, I'm hopeful, I'm, I'm often hopeful when companies buy other companies and discontinue the products, they integrate those features into their existing products at the very least. So, um, we'll see what happens here with Accusanus and Meta. Meta. Hmm. All right. Question. Traveling for my first location, sound gig out of state. Would you or anyone in chat have any cases you recommend? Um, I, so when I did out of state jobs in the past, uh, what I used were Pelican cases. So I, uh, I brought the mixer in the mixing bag on the plane with me and most everything else, well, and all the batteries, batteries had to go on the plane as well. I don't know if you're flying, flying or driving, but in my case, if you're flying, you got to keep the batteries and take them into the cabin with you. So you can't check those, or you shouldn't check those, um, at least here in the United States. I assume that's probably the case for most of the world over. Um, and then I used a Pelican case, so I've used the, I've got the 1610 and I think the 1630 or some, I don't remember the model numbers, but they're, they're relatively big, heavy, nothing got damaged. They have foam inserts, um, or you can buy different types of inserts for them to protect your gear inside. Um, I have the what they used to call the pick and pluck foam. I don't know if that's what they still call it, but in essence, you can carve out custom shapes for your particular gear if you wanted to do that, or you could just pull it all out, wrap it all in a sound blanket, <laughs> and stuff it in there and close it. A um, couple of different options there. So that's uh, that's my experience there. Rag and Bone Puppet Theater, have you tried Waves Clarity on music reduction? We have not. Um, that's another possibility there. That would work very much like Dialog um, Isolate on RX. We did compare those two previously, but not specifically with reducing music in the background, but that's another one that's worth checking out as well, absolutely. And again, like I said, Emma's on a mission to figure out how to do this, or at least, yeah, she's on a mission. She's just shaking her head that she's on a mission to figure out how to do this. So, okay. Um, Accusonus said that Meta was going to integrate theirs into something of theirs, a VR. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Meta. Oh, I don't know how I should not. I, I, I have an opinion about this, but I should probably not. What? You want your mic? Yeah, Emma wants to talk. Okay, here we go. Go ahead. Uh, Camille. I see your comment, I, your question. I don't know what the context is, though. If we may please have a little more context. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right. Rick on mic. 
I'm a voiceover, ar voiceover artist using Adobe Audition on a PC via a Motu M2. Do you know if there are any issues that might affect me if when I upgrade to Windows 11? Should I avoid Windows 11 altogether? Ooh, good question. Any Windows users out there moved from Windows 10 to Windows 11? And if so, what's been your experience with audio gear? I believe that the Motu M2, um, I would check the Motu site first of all and make sure that they support Windows 11 officially. Um, Motu is one of those companies that I would expect them to actually have done their homework um, and actually certified their software with Windows 11. So that would be the first thing I'd check. But yeah, it'd be great to have input from others. I can tell you what I do here. I'm not on Windows, but on the Mac side, um, I have a few, a, a couple of different Macs. And so I usually upgrade the laptop first and where that's where I'm not doing most of my production work. So I usually will upgrade that one first and do some testing before I upgrade my desktop Mac. So that's usually how I approach that. Um, but yeah, love to get any insights from other Windows users out there and any um, pitfalls to potentially avoid there. Thanks, Rick. That's everything for now? Okay, Emma says that's everything for now. Well, let's, uh, shall we try this over here on... Uh, let's go back to the Mac and take a look and see what we've got in terms of reverb on this particular sample. Um, I'm going to leave spectral recovery off for now, and I'm also going to turn off D-reverb. We're just going to use the dialog D-reverb. Let's get a sample here first of where we're starting. This morning I baked a loaf of bread. Apparently, even though I wasn't doing it, even though I wasn't baking a turkey this year, I still am used to getting up early and cooking something. I haven't baked a loaf of bread for probably, I'm not even sure how many years, but I wanted to make sure I used the, the jar of yeast that I sought out last year. Okay, you can see <laughs> where we're starting. Also, Danny, I, Danny was talking really fast. Bring the fader back up. Oh, fader back up. I probably dropped the fader. We're going to switch on over to this. Let's, apologies, people. We're going to play that again. Here we go. This morning I baked a loaf of bread. Apparently, even though I wasn't doing it, even though I wasn't baking a turkey this year, I still am used to getting up early and cooking something. I haven't baked a loaf of bread for probably, I'm not even sure how many years, but I wanted to make sure I used the, the jar of yeast that I sought out last year. Okay, we'll stop there. Uh, so plenty of reverb going on. She's actually talking, we intentionally went into a stairwell <laughs> with hard, with, no, with all hard surfaces, nothing that wasn't hard. Uh, and so this is where we started. So let's go ahead and come into the Dialog D reverb. So we have a couple of different things here uh, in terms of presets that we could do. And I'm not entirely sure of all the differences here. I often just dial in my own settings, but let's start with maybe general reduction and just do a preview and see what that does. I'll pop the preview on and uh, I'll bypass it as we go through. Just keep your eyes on that to know whether it's playing or processing or not processing. We'll start with it processing. This morning I baked a loaf of bread. Apparently, even though I wasn't doing it, even though I wasn't baking a turkey this year, I still am used to getting up early and cooking something. I haven't baked a loaf of bread for probably, I'm not even sure how many years, but I wanted to make sure I used the, the jar of yeast that I sought out last year in 2020 before it uh, goes bad. So we'll see how this loaf of bread turns out. I baked it quite a long time with a water bath and it, I think it'll be all right. So that's what I did this morning. Got up early, mixed up a bunch of ingredients and made a loaf of bread. Okay, so there's a, there's a first pass and actually that's better than I remember it. At least on this particular sample, it did a pretty decent job. You could see there, if I went to minus six, which uh, you know, this may be a case here too where you might want to do a fairly mild pass of this and do just a little bit of reduction each pass. That's the first thing to take into account um, as a, an overall strategy. Let me go and run through it again and let me just change the sensitivity a little bit here. We have two settings here. We have our sensitivity and we have our ambience preservation. We also have our different um, algorithms that you can use here. And I don't, we're actually not, this is just a mono recording, so I don't know if these will make a massive difference here. Um, and I have, I didn't, I didn't get a chance to prepare for this. I, I'd have to go refresh my memory on how this works. But if you always, if you need to, you can always click on the help and it will give you some uh, documentation here that will help you understand what the differences are. So here, for example, the separation algorithms. 
Um, we have channel independent. The separation algorithm is applied to the input audio channels independently. Yeah, again, this is only this is going to be mainly for uh, stereo. When we're doing a mono, it's probably not going to make a big difference here. Advanced joint channel, uh, joint channel and additional advanced processing is applied to the input audio before determining separation between dialogue and reverb. Advanced joint channel mode offers the highest quality separation results, especially when processing files with high sampling rates. This mode requires longer processing times than the other two modes. If processing time is a concern, channel independent mode can be used as a faster, lower quality alternative. So that's going to be one of the tricks too, is that when you're running through this, if you want to get a preview of what it sounds like, if you go to these others, uh, joint channel or advanced joint channel, watch what happens here when I try to play this back. So let's go back to the start and play. This morning I baked a loaf of bread. Apparently, even though I wasn't doing it, even though I wasn't baking a turkey this year, I still am used to getting up early and cooking something. I haven't baked a loaf of bread for probably I'm not even sure how many years, but I wanted to make sure I used the the jar of yeast that I sought out last year in 2020 before it uh, goes bad. So we'll see how this loaf of bread turns out. I baked it quite a long time with a water bath and it I think it'll be all right. So that's what I did this morning. Okay. So um, that, that one was really struggling to keep up. I don't know if you saw the note here, but it, it's basically playing it back with reduced quality. Um, what I think is if we apply, and again, we went really haywire here. <laughs> we pulled the sensitivity all the way up to 10, the, the ambience preservation to 100%. Actually, let's go back and do that. I want to drop this down if I don't want to reserve or re preserve the ambience. Let's see what happens there. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and for now, I'm just going to switch back to the channel independent here. So we're going to do minus 12, in terms of reduction, 100 or sorry, 10 on sensitivity, which is the max, and zero ambience preservation. This morning I baked a loaf of bread. Apparently, even though I wasn't doing it, even though I wasn't baking a turkey this year, I still am used to getting up early and cooking something. I haven't baked a loaf of bread for probably, I'm not even sure how many years, but I wanted to make sure I used the the jar of yeast that I sought out last year in 2020 before it uh, goes bad. So we'll see how this loaf of bread turns out. I baked it quite a long time with a water bath and it I think it'll be all right. So that's what I did this morning. Got up early, mixed up a bunch of ingredients and made a loaf of bread. Okay, watch what happens in the spectral view here when we go ahead and render this. I think you're going to see some differences, particularly in the higher frequencies. Let's go ahead and see what we get. It does appear that it cleared a lot of this up here. So let's play that back. This morning I baked a loaf of bread. Apparently, even though I wasn't doing it, even though I wasn't baking a turkey this year. And then undo and play again. This morning I baked a loaf of bread. Apparently, even though I wasn't doing it, even though I wasn't baking a turkey this year. Okay, redo. This morning I baked a loaf of bread. Apparently, even though I wasn't doing it, even though I wasn't baking a turkey this year, I still am used to getting up early. So there you go, um, Mark. That's a just a quick run through. We can come back and do something a lot more in depth, but. I think what we're finding there is that if you push it too hard, you get that kind of really weird artifacty type sound. Um, sounds like they're talking into a pillow and it starts to cut off some of their dialogue as well. So you have to be a little bit careful when pushing it. Um, but it does actually a surprisingly decent job there. So there's some other things that we could clean up on this particular one too. There is a massive low frequency something or other going on in here. <laughs> when I would just uh, probably come in, we can get the EQ and uh, pull up that high pass filter here. We ran through that really quickly. That takes care of a good bit of that. Um, just going to make it better, for, especially for people listening on headphones that can reproduce a lot of bass or uh, subwoofers. Um, that would just be rattling their whole room there. Um, but there, I would normally leave that in while you're doing the reduction and kind of remove that a little later. Sometimes those learning algorithms need that lower frequency material as well. Not necessarily in this case, but I was, you know, normally I would would do that. Okay. Let's see. Is there anything else, Emma, in the chat that we need to take a look at? Okay. 
Emma Shoji Productions. Good to have you here again. You have, by the way, you ask great questions. Uh, here's today's question. Have you tried the relatively new voice isolation feature in Final Cut Pro 10 or Final Cut Pro actually? Um, no, I have not. A lot of people, I've heard a lot of people talking about it. I have not used it yet. Um, evidently pretty good. It's, it's basically like a dialogue isolate from what I can gather. So if you are a Final Cut Pro editor, that might be something worth checking. In fact, if we go over to Final Cut here, let's see what we've got here. I don't know that I have a, I don't have a clip in there, but just to show people where it's located, we can go ahead and pop over that, Emma. Um, I, for example, if I choose this clip, go over to the sound tab, here is the new voice isolation. If you check that box, um, you get to choose the amount. And of course, um, is that, yeah, that's basically it, the amount. So you get to dial in the amount, which is very similar actually to Dialog Isolate. So pretty neat to have that right in the video editing app. Could potentially make things easier. So definitely something I need to take a look at, haven't done just yet. Uh, Lewin, how does one conceal a lav on someone wearing a dress? <laughs> well, um, it depends on the context, first of all. So if you're talking about corporate video, um, a lot of times what I would do in those circumstances, it's, it's very different. When you're working with actors, they are used to the somewhat delicate process of hiding lavaliers. Um, so that's the first thing. If you're working with someone in a corporate video setting where they're not an actor, maybe they're an executive or a, a director or something at that company, um, they're probably not going to be comfortable having you say, you know, basically take your open, open up your dress so that I can put this lavalier microphone under there. Um, so what I have done in those circumstances when I'm working in corporate video, what I will do is describe to the women how to hide the lavalier microphone. In their case, it's usually a little bit more straightforward for women. Um, because I can often have them take a lavalier microphone with a clip and clip it between the two cups, um, between the cup and the um, their skin. So they can go into the restroom. I just give them the lavalier microphone. I don't give them the pack. Um, I don't like to have people take the wireless packs into the bathroom because they often get dropped and so on and so forth. But just the lavalier microphone, then they can do that clipping. Um, and then I also, if possible, I give them some tape here so they can also put a loop, I'll put the loop in it first, but with some tape over it so they can tape that to their skin so that if that cable does get tugged, there's that relief there as well. So it doesn't transfer as much of the, that energy of moving of the cable up into the microphone. So that's typically how I do it for someone who is not an actor. If they are an actor, then, you know, if, and if they're, you know, accustomed to doing this type of thing, then it's it's largely a very much be, being very clear about what we're going to do, walking through step by step, going to a place that's a little bit more private. So, um, and if they have, if they want to have someone with them, absolutely support that 100%, um, just so that it's not an awkward experience. And then you can just tell them exactly what you're going to do before you do it so that they know what to expect is usually the experience I found that works best. So it's a great question, Lewin. Glad you asked. Uh, Camille, thank you so much. This is for the Midsummer Barbecue. It actually turns out that we are going to do a little celebration today uh, for a birthday in the family. So <laughs> no barbecue today. Specifically, we did a barbecue a couple weeks ago, but uh, thank you very much, Camille, for the super chat. Teacher of Teachers, very basic newbie question to add to the topic of lavs. Does a foam cover on a lavalier worn outside a collar or lapel, not concealed, serve any purpose on an indoor shoot. Potentially, I mean, it, it could help a tiny, tiny bit in terms of plosives if the person happens to, you know, turn their face down. And it's a microphone that has a tendency to um, to have plosives when you talk directly into it. So it can serve that purpose. Sometimes they're voiced specifically. Uh, I Usually this is going to be the lower end microphones in my experience. They're voiced, well, the higher end microphones are often voiced to be hidden under clothing, first of all, just to um, or under the under a foam um, for the less expensive microphones I I don't know how they're voiced it, it's all over the place um, so it can help with plosives potentially and sometimes on the pro level microphones they are voiced to be hidden under clothing or to be use the foam cover so I would just try both of those to see which one's working best in that particular case that's that's how I would think of foam covers for lavaliers when worn outside the clothing 
Okay, that's it? Mm -hmm. That's all we have, Emma says. All right. Well, um, what else do we have that we can show here? We do have, for those that have Roadcaster Pro 2s or are interested, <laughs> we have a new video walking through the basics of setting up the compressor in the Roadcaster Pro 2. So if you're interested in that, that's over on the main channel. Um, I had mentioned last week that we were working on a review of the new Deity TC1 timecode generator boxes. And we were going to do that this week. I got a little bit sick the start of the week, so that ended up getting put on hold because there's a little bit more work to go into that one. So hopefully we'll be able to pick that one up this coming week and take a look at those. Can't promise it'll be next Sunday, but that's the target right now. So we'll see how that pans out. All right. Let's, uh, oh, here's a question. Oh, Techno Cheesecake has a question about radio. Let's have a look and see what you say, what you have here. They're typing. You're typing. Okay. <laughs> Tippy tap typing right now. So we'll look forward to that question. Um, Emma, do you want to tell us a little bit about your current mixing project? I have a mixing project? Of course oh, yeah. you have a mixing project. I do have a mixing project. Um, I'm learning how to mix and produce instrumental uh, recordings. And I will probably also learn how to master. Out of necessity. <laughs> More or less, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's the context for this? What Can you share? Or is this top secret? After the wrap date, I will tell you all about it. Okay. But it, it is in the works, and it will be discussed. Okay. So. Very good. Good, good. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Here's the other part of Techno Cheesecake's question. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. I've been asked to operate and manage a radio station. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> what would be your recommendation on starting... And broadcasting. I have never done this techno cheesecake. I have no idea what's involved. Um, I don't know if you mean like a traditional, like a traditional broadcast station with a big transmitter tower. Um, I know we have some people in here that have worked on it, that have been to the Sound for Video sessions that have worked in radio, um, but I have zero experience doing that. The closest I've ever gotten is it when I, I think it was my first year that I went to the National Association of Broadcasters. I one of the things that is kind of fun is that when you um, go to the restaurant to eat, for example, I went to the restaurant the night I got there and um, ate at the bar. And there was another guy sitting there and we got to chatting and he was an older fellow and he'd been, he was a veteran of the radio industry and we got to talk about a whole bunch of things. Um, I got to pick his brain for about an hour. Poor guy didn't get to eat much, <laughs> but that's the closest I've ever been to traditional broadcast. So I don't really know. A lot about it from that standpoint um, but yeah where could one go to find out about traditional broadcast radio I, again maybe a clarification maybe you're talking about internet radio I don't know if you have more input let us know the techno cheesecake story arc has been pretty good I agree it has been interesting <laughs> to see how that goes. Randy asks, is there an easy way with some of the isotope tools to reduce ringing slight feedback in a recording? Ooh. Um, that I think is largely a matter of finding the frequency that you're you're looking at. Spectral repair might be something you can look at. You'd, you'd have to identify where it is specifically and then um, a lot of times you can actually paint it out. Kind of like what Emma was showing earlier here. Um, but instead, if you want to switch over to the Mac here, E, um, we have this spectral recovery. Oh, no, sorry, not spectral recovery, spectral repair. Um, you have a couple of different options for how you're repairing. You can attenuate. You can replace the sound. You can replace it with a pattern or um, replace it with partials plus noise. Pretty interesting stuff here. So what you do in practical terms is you actually paint the part that you want to repair in particular and then you apply that particular that that um, algorithm for that part so just visually you can see if I do that with the attenuate it pulled it way down here um, that was at a strength of two so let's undo that another option here replace so replace essentially takes some of the surrounding material and replaces it with what's here 
So you can see that looks a little smoother in some respects. Um, so you just really have to determine where that is, but that would be kind of the first thing that comes to my mind in terms of how to address um, any sort of feedback or ringing. Something to look at there. Okay. Southpaw, what's something interesting you learned this week? I learned something really interesting from this book right here. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about that. The interesting thing I learned here was that in the interviews with uh, some of the European production mixers, I didn't realize this, but evidently, aside from the UK, in a lot of the rest of the of continental Europe, uh, the person that is hired to do the production sound mixing, the, the actual recording during the, uh, you know, the when they're actually filming the movie, um, oftentimes also plays the role of post-production. They do the, you know, as either as a sound supervisor or whatever. Um, I did not realize that. Here in the United States, that's not typically the case. Usually the post team is completely separate from the production team. So that was kind of something interesting that I learned there. And in some respects, that's that's interesting. I think it's I think it's harder. It's more complicated from a doing it the European way is is more challenging. And this is what this particular mixer said was it's more challenging from the standpoint that it kind of when when you're a production sound mixer, you usually have a team of people that you're used to working with. So you usually have a boom operator or two. You usually have a sound utility technician, um, a utility a sound utility technique is that the right one yeah anyway you have a utility and or, or perhaps multiple and the problem is is if you are doing production and then you go into post you can't keep that team oftentimes um employed <laughs> while you're in post so it makes things a little bit more complicated that way um which might be why they do it the way they do it here in the united states i'm not sure um, but that was one of the insights that they had so something really interesting that i learned this week about production sound thanks for asking I hope you learned something interesting about sound this week as well, and love for you to share that as well. Uh, Linda says, more about recording level guidelines, please. I always true peak between minus 20 and minus 12 dB. I think it's context dependent, Linda. It really depends on what you're doing. Um, if you're working on a scripted piece where you know that people aren't going to yell or laugh or scream or whatever, I think it's okay to sometimes push closer to minus 12 Um if you're if it's a less scripted or you're working with a director on a piece, for example, where they might value um, extemporaneous um, type performance where they might just let things go and let the actors do what they're going to do and see if they get something that's golden, um, you might need to keep a little bit more headroom. So minus 20 is pretty low on the on the professional equipment. You can generally, you know, or, or even on a mix pre or a, a zoom F3 and up series. You can get away with that easily. Um, that's going to be a little trickier on some of the more consumer-oriented gear. You probably want to push the levels a little harder because you're, in my experience, um, just to kind of keep things managed because otherwise you'll have to boost a whole lot in post. And so your noise floor and your um, dialogue or whatever else you're recording will be closer together, potentially, depending on a whole lot of factors. Good question and great, great discussion worth having. Okay, hey, last one. Emma has declared this question the last one. Is the Judd family going on a well-deserved vacation? The Judd family just got back from a well-deserved vacation a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> uh, we went on a vacation down to Lake Powell. If you haven't heard of Lake Powell, Lake Powell is a massive lake, although unfortunately shrinking dramatically and very quickly in southern Utah. It's in the Red Rock region of southern Utah. So there are these beautiful Red Rock cliffs and it's snakes, isn't it like 90 miles long? Yeah. Something like that. So it's about 90 miles in these narrow canyons of a beautiful lake. And uh, Emma was our captain. We, we rented a powerboat and had a little bit of a cruise through parts of Lake Powell. And then we also camped for a few days after that um, and kind of explored some of the areas in the southern part of Utah as well, including, I think a highlight was the uh, Monument Valley which is right at the four, there are four corner, four states that come together right there. There's Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona. And there are some, on, on the Native American reservation there, there is this place called um, 
Monument Valley. And Monument Valley is these beautiful red rock spires out at this really just, it's just a beautiful stark landscape. <laughs> and that was our first time there. Um, Danny, I think Danny had been there before, but that was our first time there. And it was really, really beautiful, really, really neat to get a chance to see that. So that was our well-deserved vacation fairly recently. Uh, will we be taking more? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Emma declares, yes, we will be taking more. So, all right, everybody, um, before we go, I do need to come back in and reduce the fader on the music track, the Mac here, so that we don't blow your ears out when we go out here. Um, I hope you all have a great week. Oh, wait, Kevin. Wow. Darn it. I'm late. Could you start over? Extemporaneous. Wow. <laughs> um, no, but I can promise you that the replay is available. Um, it's good, good to see you, Kevin. Uh, get out there. Make some great sound. Uh, learn something about sound this week, whatever it might be. Uh, as I mentioned before, there is a link for this book down below. Um, this was sent to me, and full disclosure, it was sent to me by Edgar himself, the author himself, and he asked me to uh, have a read of it and provide any feedback. And my feedback, Edgar, if you are watching, excellent, excellent material. Really appreciate you sending that over, and it has enriched my life as a soundie. So get out there, make some great sound, and we'll talk to you all again really soon. Take care, everybody.